I'll introduce you to another great American, Joseph Farah of WorldNet Daily, the CEO. And here's Mr. Farah. Well, where to begin? Where to begin? I agree with everything that guy just said. <laughs> Let's start there. And I, and I want to thank Larry Clayman for organizing this. Uh, this demonstration today, for a long time, I've been, you know, for those of you who read my column, I've been, you know, bemoaning the fact that where are Americans amidst this growing tyranny that we're seeing in America today? You know, we've heard of the litany of high crimes and misdemeanors perpetrated by the occupant of the White House, but, you know, it's, it goes beyond Obama. You know, Obama is not the problem. He's a symptom of the problem, a much deeper problem in this country. You know, you can get rid of Obama and there are guys lined up behind him to take his place who will be executing tyrannical policies just like Barack Obama. And that's what we've got to get our, our hands around. But I applaud Larry Clayman, my good friend of many, many years, my attorney, my friend, um, for organizing this today, and, and you know, let's let this be the beginning uh, of a movement to take America back. You know, today is a very uh, auspicious day. Anybody know what today is? That's exactly right. We've got a very informed audience here today. Uh, you know, you may, much, much of the media has, I think, not uh, really acknowledged the fact that today is the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And, you know, I took a look at this address. It's so short. It's remarkably a short, concise document. And I think it would be worth taking a minute or two to recall the words of Abraham Lincoln 150 years ago. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Yeah, say it with me. Now, we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation, so conceived or so dedicated can long endure. We are now on a great battlefield of that war. And remember, folks, more than 50,000 Americans died on that battlefield. That's like the number of Americans who died in that very long, protracted Vietnam War that we all recall. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives, that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow, hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, no one remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they, who fought here, have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to that great task remaining before us, that from, those, from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and 
the government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. That's what we're all about. That's why we're here today. For a nation that was consecrated as a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. We've lost our vision, folks. You know this. That's why you're here. This was a country under the rule of law, the will of the people, a great constitution. America has, has forgotten, indeed, not just the words uttered by Lincoln, but that America was indeed founded as one nation under God, committed to a new birth of liberty, guided by a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Will we allow that vision, that dream, that goal to perish? Will this be the generation of Americans to throw away the very concept of self-government under the rule of law? You know, sometimes we need to uh, leave the United States to, to remember what it represents. I just got back from a trip overseas having spent about 10 days in, in Israel. And uh, by the way, I got good news for you folks. Obama is even less popular in Israel today than he is right here in, in this country. So, you know, my perspective today, there's so much we could talk about. There's so many horrible scandals and corruption. It's so rife. But my perspective today is more like one from 30,000 feet. I, I see America squandering what may well be its last chance to hold on to the dream of its founders who sought to do something unique in world history, to remove the shackles from the people and place them on the central government in the form of a constitution that clearly guaranteed the rights of the people powers of Washington and reserved the powers not clearly enumerated to the federal government to the several states. That's what it's all about. And we have gotten, we are so far removed today from that precept. To preserve that dream, it's no longer enough to restrain further abuses. We've got to reverse them. We've got to recapture vision of our founding fathers, the spirit of the founders, and, the, and, and make ourselves spiritually, morally, and intellectually worthy of self-government once again. You know, we get a problem with self-government. What, what does self-government require? The founders knew it required a moral people, uh, people who knew the difference between right and wrong. Because what is self-government? Self-government is when we govern ourselves without the help of police forces and coercion by government. It also requires an informed people. The founders understood this. And unfortunately, I think some of the princes in this town understand it as well. I think that's one of the reasons we're obliterating the distinctions between right and wrong in this country. It's one of the reasons you no longer have a free press in this country, with the notable exception of WMD, of course. So what is our, our choice? Can we go, are we going to go the way of other nations of the world, the fallen empires, the kingdoms, the, the lands where rulers ruled and people quivered in fear of their government? You know, today may seem like any other day in American history to most of America, but until Americans awaken from their slumber, like you have today, and reject the path of tyranny, I'm not sure how many more days we have left of the American dream. I ask this question rhetorically because I know who you are, who we are today, but we've got an awful lot of Americans today. I'm really wondering whether they will have 
have the right answer to this question. Are we content to be part of the generation of Americans that betrayed the dream and left our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren a nation less than the one into which we were born? Are we content to be part of the generation of Americans that wasn't willing to sacrifice their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor in the name of liberty? Are we content to see America squandering its last chance to hold on to all that made the country great, prosperous, and blessed by God? You know, I'm reminded of a passage in the Bible. 1 Samuel 8. Um, you know, Israel was, was a nation blessed by God governed by God. He was their king. He was to be their king. So it was a nation that didn't have a king. And in 1 Samuel 8, we hear the cries of the people of Israel to Samuel, tell Darius, and he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them to hear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. Does this sound familiar, folks? Yes. We're not supposed to have a king in America either. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king which ye shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. That we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. It's, a, it's you know, there's nothing new under the sun, folks. The choice is very clear. We're either going to be a self-governing nation or we're going to have rulers over us. This was the great experiment in liberty that America was and is and hopefully will be in the future. Yeah. You know, I said I didn't want to deal with all of these huge, pro you know, we can talk about the IRS, you know, conducting political audits. We can talk about the federal government, you know, eavesdropping on reporters, eavesdropping on every single person here, every American through the NSA. We can go over all of these terrible uh, abuses that we're seeing today. But for some reason, I'm haunted by something. Sometimes, you know, you, the, the macro problems are so overwhelming that it's hard to get clarity on what's happening in our nation. Something happened in this town about six weeks ago that has haunted me ever since. Does anyone know the name Miriam Carey? And this is, the story of Miriam Carey is kind of symptomatic of something that's happening throughout the United States right now. We are becoming a police state. Miriam Carey, young black woman, mother, made a wrong turn right across the street over there. She may have been mentally unbalanced, we don't really know. When she pulled up to one of these entrances to the White House, guns were drawn on her. She had a little baby in the back seat. She freaked out. Yeah. I would have freaked out. Yeah. And uh, she didn't know what to do, so she you know, started driving. She rammed the barricade. It didn't hurt anybody. Uh, guns drawn on her. Finally, she backs out of there, and she leads uh, the Capitol Police on a, a chase around the city. She's unarmed. Finally, she's surrounded by Capitol Police, and she does what any one of us would have done in that situation. She gets out of her car, 
and she is blown away by a firing squad of we don't know how many police. If you look at the videos and the photos, it looks like about 25 people uh, shooting her down. We're, we're still seeking the forensics report on this. It hasn't been released. And what happened after that? Those cops went to Congress and got a standing ovation for shooting down an unarmed black woman with a baby in the back seat who had done, you know, hadn't hurt anybody, hadn't threatened anybody. You know, I've been around a while. I've lived in major, you know, I've lived in New York, L.A., other cities, and I can recall over the last 20, 30, 40 years all the times there have been police shootings, sometimes of real bad guys. And you've got these, you know, police review boards and, you know, the cops are routinely suspended until an investigation is con Nothing like that in Washington, D.C. Right. In the case of Miriam Carey. That's right. And I think this case is symptomatic of the, of the moral breakdown, the inability to distinguish right from wrong anymore in this country. So, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but, you know, I'm here today for Miriam Carey, and the people, the people like her. They don't deserve to be shot down in the streets like dogs by a firing squad of Capitol Police who get applauded by our princes in this in this town. Why is it that, that the, 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 the reaction to that shooting is so different than the reactions we might see if a, uh, a, a police shooting in New York or Los Angeles? Because the princes of this city need to be protected at all costs, even from an unarmed black mom who poses no threat at all. Anyway, I'm thinking about Miriam Carey today, and I'm thinking about what's becoming of our country, the corruption at the moral core of, of this country. And with that, I thank you all for coming out. I've been, I have been praying for Americans to rise up, to get out into the streets, and to start protesting like we did in 2010 and, and 20... You know, where is the Tea Party today? We've got to get that mobilized again. And so let's pray that this is the, this is the beginning. And thank you, Larry Clayman, for organizing this rally. Let it be the first of many. God bless. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Joseph's absolutely right. What did Mary and Carrie do? She ran into a White House gate because she was upset. She had postpartum syndrome. And because she ran into the president's White House gate, she gets shot dead. That's what we're dealing with right now. Whether it's the NSA, her, IRS, or anybody else. You challenge him, and you'll pay the price. You know what? I'm going to pay the price, and I want you to pay the price. Yeah. We're not scared of anybody. Yeah.